you either the far civil rights or you're not. You're either the party of Lincoln or you ain't. And that's by God put up or shut up. We've been talking about this for a hundred years. Looks like it's about time to stop talking. Tonight on The Passionate Eye, the secret recordings of one of the most underestimated presidents of all time. Hello, I'm Katherine Olson, and welcome to The Passionate Eye. Secretly recorded conversations have proved the bane of several American presidents. They helped impeach Nixon in the 70s, and now they threaten the Clinton administration. Secret recordings also provide the guts of tonight's documentary. But in this case, they may cause you to improve your opinion of another president, one who until recently never really escaped the shadow of his assassinated predecessor. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th president of the United States, was one of those conflicted, larger-than-life figures who goaded political writers into comparing him to Macbeth, Lear, and Richard III. But to your average American or Canadian, he was simply the guy who followed in the wake of Kennedy. Tonight's documentary allows us to eavesdrop on candid telephone conversations secretly recorded during the first hundred days of Johnson's administration. They refresh our memory, reminding us, for example, that it was Johnson, not Kennedy, who pushed through the controversial civil rights legislation in the 60s. The documentary is called, Hello, Mr. President. The President would like to talk to Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. Hello, Edgar. Uh, I don't hear you well. What's the matter? You got this phone tap? No, no. How many, how many, how many shots were fired? Three. three. Any of them fired at me? I know there was no that. All three or two. Three. All three of the president, and we have them. The, the third shot tore a large part of the president's head off. And we have that. And we have the gun here also. And uh, we also have tested the fact that you could fire those three shots were fired. Uh, within three seconds. Were they aiming at the president? They were aiming directly at the president. So there's, there's no question about that. Far from being bugged by his FBI chief, it was President Johnson who was secretly recording that telephone call. Three days after taking over at the White House, he ordered his secretary to put a recording device across his line. This was a, t a very primitive taping system done on something called dictaphone belts. And dictaphone belts were simply small sleeves, blue, small blue and red sleeves, which went around a turntable of a kind. The decision was the president's. When I told him that someone was on the line, his word would be, take this one. And take it meant activate the machine. This is what the Oval Office looked like when Johnson sat. 4,000 hours of calls made here were secretly recorded and locked away for history. The first installment of 190 hours has now been declassified. The tapes provide an extraordinary insight into the way the presidency works and into the complex mind of the man who took over when Kennedy was killed. It publicizes that I'm pro-Russian, right when Nixon's running against me. That's all it does. All the voices you will hear are extracts from these recordings. We have reconstructed some scenes to help illustrate the story of the most turbulent transition between presidents in American history. Well, it ain't. Don't try to shit me, because I know better. Air Force 
Johnson demanded that he take the presidential oath without delay. A conversation recorded later reveals why. He thought the Kremlin might have ordered the assassination, that other killings might follow, and that American government must be seen to be functioning. And I thought that uh, it was a conspiracy. What raced through my mind was that if they had shot our president driving down there, who would they shoot next? And what would they, what was going on in Washington? And when would the missiles be coming? Aboard Air Force One, Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy stayed at the rear of the plane, close to the coffee. Johnson, sitting further forward in the president's seat, made several telephone calls. One was to Rose Kennedy, the dead president's mother. Uh, Break Crown Air Force One, uh, volunteer requesting a patch with Mrs. Rose and Kennedy uh, as soon as possible. Go ahead. Ms. Kennedy? I wish to God there was something that I could do, and I wanted to tell you that we were grieving with you. Thank you very much. I know you love Jack and he loves you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. He was silent. All we could hear were the engines. People were whispering. People were walking and treading very carefully because there were two different sets of people who didn't know each other and who were thrown together under the worst experience and the worst circumstance you could think of in your life. When it came time for me to type the president's arrival statement, this was almost irreverent. It was such a sp spiritual place. Um, all of us were close to some sort of connection to any god that we might have had. And to hear the clacking of a typewriter was an insult. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God. I thought the most important thing in the world was to decide who was president of this country at that moment. I was fearful that the communists were trying to take us over. Johnson's determination to show that he was in charge caused friction between the personal aides he was bringing in and the existing White House staff. It started early next morning at the doors of the Oval Office. And at 8.30, Alva J. came in and said to me, Miss Lincoln, would you come into the office with me? I walked in the Oval Office. He said, uh, I need you more than you need me. He said, would, could you get all of this, all of the Kennedy uh, possessions out of the Oval Office, your office, and the cabinet room? By nine o'clock, I went to Bobby, and Bobby just could not understand it. I felt resented. Um, we were dealing with the staff, which is decimated. There was nobody to tell us, here are the telephones. The restrooms are down the hall, and you get a coffee down there. We were different, and we were in their space. This was their home their White House, they had worked to get elected there. We did not belong there. And they had lost their best friend. They hurt. Right field for disagreement. In those first few days, Johnson suspected Robert Kennedy of making mischief. Here were two strong-willed, ambitious men, one unable to accept the consequences of his brother's death, the other determined not to allow the Kennedy mystique to undermine his own rightful authority as the new president. Philosophically, every way, his brother's loss was devastating to him. He was never the same person afterwards. And yet he had to carry on not only his duties as Attorney General of the United States, but his duties as the leader of the Kennedy family succeeding the leader who had fallen. And that meant that 
many people were already talking about him running for president. It meant many people were trying to stir animosity against Lyndon Johnson and, and use him and bring him into it. So, of course, there was a Bobby problem, as Lyndon Johnson uh, called it. Uh, also, they detested each other. But Johnson needed the younger candidate to stay on as Attorney General, at least for now. Three days into the new presidency, Johnson's recording machine was up and running, and it reveals how Johnson kept Kennedy on board. He asked Clark Clifford, a man they both could trust, to be an intermediary. Clark Clifford on line two. Yes, Clark. Uh, Mr. President? Yes. Yeah. I've just finished a, a two-hour session with Bobby. Yeah. And um, first I want to say uh, he's going to stay. Okay. Uh, we, we really had it out. And uh, we, we covered it all, and um, I think uh, there's some arguments that he found unanswerable. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm just authorized to say now that, that he's going to stay. Uh, he's going to have a talk with you, and I ought to have a talk with you first. And, um, it's a relationship that I, I, I think is exceedingly important, and, and it's one that we ought to look at together. All right. An even more intriguing call was put through to J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. The Kennedys had kept Hoover at arm's length. Dangerous as a rattlesnake, he once been called. But that wasn't Johnson's style. He wanted to keep Hoover inside the tent, as this creepy little exchange shows. You're more than the head of the Federal Bureau, as far as I'm concerned. You're my brother and personal friend, and you have been for 25, 30 years. I got more confidence in your judgment than anybody in town. I certainly appreciate your confidence. Well, thank you. Thank you. What you'll hear next is part of a personal briefing Hoover gave the president five days after the assassination. We hope to have this thing wrapped up today, but uh, the bubble top was not up. But the bubble top wasn't worth a damn anyway because it made entirely a, a, a plastic. And uh, much to my surprise, the Secret Service do not have any armored cars. Do you... Uh, do you have a, a bulletproof car? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, you I think do. I ought to have one? I think you most certainly should have one. Most certainly should. I think you've got to recognize <coughs> you've got to really almost be in the, in the capacity of a so-called prisoner. They went on to talk about Jack Ruby, or Rubenstein, killing Oswald. All because, according to Hoover, the Dallas police were trying to please the television networks by parading Oswald before the cameras. The chief of police admits that he uh, moved him in the morning uh, as a convenience and at the request of a motion picture people who wanted to have daylight. Now, uh, this fellow Rubenstein is a, is a very shady character. He likes to be in the limelight. He knew all the police. That's how I think he got into police headquarters and for that reason raised no, with no question. I thought they, they never made any moves as, as the picture show, even when they saw him approaching and got up right to him and pressed his pistol against, uh, against Oswald's stomach. Uh, uh, neither of the police officers on either side made any move to push him away or to grab him. Have you got any, uh, any relationship between the two here? Uh, between uh, uh, Rubenstein? Yeah. No. At the present time, we have not. Behind the scenes, even during the funeral, was a dispute about the assassination inquiry. Johnson wanted to leave it to Hoover and the police force in Dallas. Others insisted that only a presidential commission of inquiry would do. When the Congress threatened to hold its own hearings, Johnson gave in, provided he could choose the members. America's Chief Justice Earl Warren was persuaded to be chairman. As Warren's deputy, Johnson wanted his oldest friend in the Senate, Richard Russell of Georgia. What you now hear is a classic example of Johnson's strong arm technique. Dick? Yes, Mr. President? I want you to know that I made an announcement. Well, an announcement of what? May I read it to you? Yes. The President announced that he is appointing a special commission to study and report upon the assassination of the late President John F. Kennedy. The members of the special commission are, colon, Chief Justice Earl Warren Chairman, Senator Richard Russell, Georgia. Well, now, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I know I don't have to tell you my motion to you, but I just can't serve on, on that commission to the Chief Justice Warren. I, I don't like that man, and I don't have any confidence in him. That case has already been announced, and you can serve with anybody 
for the good of America. Now, the reason I ask Warren is because he's the chief justice of this country. The reason I ask you is because you have that same kind of temperament. And you can do anything for your country. And don't go to give me that kind of stuff about you can't serve with anybody. You can do anything. You never turned your country down. You, well, this is not me. That's your country. You're my man on that commission, and you're going to do it. And don't tell me what you can do and what you can't, because uh, I can't arrest you, and I'm not going to put the FBI on you, but uh, you're goddamn sure going to serve, I'll tell you that. I think you did wrong getting Warren. I know damn well you got wrong getting me, but no. I hope do the best you can. I think that's what you do. That's kind of American both of you. Good night. Good night. To the new president, every government building in Washington seemed to be swarming with men and women appointed by Kennedy, still grieving for their hero and resenting the usurper from Texas. As vice president, Johnson had felt patronized by Kennedy's inner circle, the Harvards, as he bitterly called them. In a telephone call to his secretary of state, Dean Rusk, we get a glimpse of Johnson's conviction that those who loved Kennedy would never be loyal to him. Well, I think steak leaks everything they got. I've got about as much confidence in them as I have in a Soviet spy. They leak everything they get. I'm wondering if our wires are tapped at all. Every time I say something to the State Department, I read about it. And I just, uh, it's getting me frightened to even talk, take a call. I think we've got, that's just a sieve over there. This is getting awfully bad, and it's, it's, it's going to hurt me and hurt State, but I'm not, I'm not quit talking to anybody. I'm just going to take you off in the bathroom, because I'm afraid that uh, somebody over there is talking, and talking regularly. Another call made late one night shows Johnson's constant need for reassurance, even comfort. He is talking here to Kay Graham, owner of the Washington Post, and a close friend of the Kennedys. Hello. Hello, Mr. President. Hello, my sweetheart. How are you? Well, I'm fine. Are you? You know, the only one thing I dislike about this job is that uh, I'm married and uh, I can't ever get to see you. I just hear that sweet voice and uh, it's always on telephone. And I'd oh. like to break out of here and be like one of these young animals down on my ranch, jump a fence. <laughs> <laughs> What had prompted Johnson's flirtation with one of America's most important publishers was a behind-the-scenes row over his first speech as president to Congress. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. It was his fifth day in power. Johnson had chosen Capitol Hill for his platform because it was the Congress that had brought Kennedy's legislative program to a halt. Ninety-three bills were ruled in committees and now waiting for the Johnson treatment to turn them into law. On the 20th day of January, in 1961, John F. Kennedy told his countrymen, let us begin. Today, in this moment of new resolve, I would say to all my fellow Americans, let us continue. The speech was a triumph. Only insiders knew that the last little backstage squabble had preceded its delivery. Johnson had asked Ted Sorensen, a Kennedy favorite, to write the speech. To Johnson, what Sorensen actually produced was a long eulogy to Kennedy that said nothing of his own intentions as president. Johnson called his old friend Abe Fortas to take charge, and discarded three quarters of Sorensen's draft. I recall we had one hell of a time because uh, Sorensen guarded his uh, prose with uh, the zeal of a samurai warrior. But I remember riding over to the Capitol. I know Sorensen was in the car. And in his hands, he was clasping into his bosom, was the three-ring binder in which was enclosed the speech of, of the president before that joint session. Uh, he made it clear he wasn't going to let anybody, maybe not even the president, look at that speech again until he put it on the rostrum so that nobody could uh, make a substitution. Johnson was not accustomed to insubordination. He wanted to make sure the press had his side of the story, hence the call to Kay Graham. It's so difficult. I, I just, uh, it was tragic the other night. I could have just 
blown everything and fallen on my head. It was uh, such agony that I haven't recovered from it. Oh, I know. Uh, I've got uh, all these temperamental people, and they all go and cry, and they say, well, uh, Abe Fortas uh, put this paragraph in and took my paragraph out. Now, the speech that came in was a, a great tribute to a great man. But the Congress expected a little something else. They wanted to know how I was going to stand on these things, and I had to say so. And I had to say action now, but, but he, can, we, uh, he did it to me going up to delivery. We spent the whole time arguing, and I said, well, you've got 80% of your stuff in there. Uh, uh, he was just unforgivable, and yet I think that we all have to just imagine how he feels, that he's a man who doesn't, instead of crying, he, he did this really naughty trick, but of, of being cantankerous and hurt, because... He had that peculiar relationship with President Kennedy. Well, uh, I've uh, uh, done as much as I can with I have any pride and self-respect left. Johnson's call didn't heal any wounds. The ghost of John Kennedy would continue to haunt his presence. The Pasha and I will continue with Hello, Mr. President, right after this short break. The Pasha and I continues with Hello, Mr. President. Margaret? Mr. President. Lyndon Johnson, how are you? Well, I'm fine, thank you. I'm too... Capitol Hill had been the love of Lyndon Johnson's life. Now, in the Oval Office, he was lonely, missing his old companions. But there was always the telephone. I just wanted to call you and tell you I loved you, and I didn't have anything to talk to you about except I missed seeing you there on that front row. Well, come on up and see us. Well, I wish I could, but they won't let me get over there, and uh, they got a big rock wall around me down here, and I'm going to have to get you to crawl under it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you behave yourself. Oh, yeah. uh, because that, uh, that's the most important at the moment. You're doing a wonderful job. We want to keep on doing it. I'm going to do the best yeah. I can, honey. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm just going to do what I think's best every day, and I appreciate uh, talking to you, and I'll see you soon. Bye, dear. The telephone became his Excalibur, his great weapon. Because a couple of times I'd say, Mr. President, maybe we ought to have him, some congressman or somebody, come in and talk to you in your local office for a personal visit. And I said, it'll be a very brief visit, believe me, a few minutes. He said, Jack, by the time that somebody comes in here and tells me how smart he is and what he wants and scratches his ass, I've lost 15 to 25 minutes. Johnson always said that a president has two years at the most to impose his will on Congress. Immediately after Kennedy's death, he'd held the country together and earned its respect. Now he wanted action, and that meant rousing the Senate from its habitual lethargy. He called one of the Senate elders, John Stennis of Mississippi. Senator Stennis on the phone. John, you try to get those folks up there to go to work. People are laughing at him. The bar yeah. barbers are talking about it. Yeah. I got a haircut, and the barber said, "What in God's world happened to Congress?" Yeah, well, they, they paid on an annual basis, and they haven't. They took off. Uh, yeah. They took off two weeks for Thanksgiving. Now they want off three weeks for Christmas. Said, "I just get off one day for each." Yeah. Get them to work some, John. Tell them you'll stay there at night if they need to. I never saw. He was a tornado on a leash. He was a human being, a man of great extremes. He could be very, very kind. He could be very, very angry and very, very cruel. He had trouble with his anger. Where do I put this thing? And so you could, it was almost as if you could see the man with this ball of anger and he didn't know where to put it. And woe to the person who was near. Well, I've been... Well, he's given us three billion two and cost cities of that one. And I've got to run the foreign policy of the country. Then there was the so-called Johnson treatment. An ability to dominate, charm, and shock. His staff could never be sure what he'd say next. I reached an agreement with McClellan on the transportation bill. I brought it back to Johnson. I was very happy. I said, Mr. President, I've got an agreement. I've got the, we got a deal, we got a bill. And I described the agreement to him. And Johnson said, open your fly. And I kind of laughed. He said, open your fly. He said, there's nothing in there. He said, John McClellan just took that off with a razor so thin you didn't even feel it. He picks up the phone. He calls John McClellan. He says, John, he says, uh, you got Joe Califano's pecker up there, and you're, he said, and I want him to come up there and get it back. We can't agree to a deal like this. We got to have another kind of deal. And I went back up there, and we had another kind of deal that was much more acceptable to Johnson. He was a man of ferocious energy. He often went to sleep at 2 a.m. and was up by 6. And he demanded the same dedication from everyone around him. It's a marathon. 
the, the days would go from 8 in the morning until sometimes 3 at night. I always teased him and I said that, you, that he, cut, he cut two words out of every dictionary in the White House. The first word was vacation. We never even knew what that meant. And the other was sleep, because we got so little of it. And so if we didn't know the definitions, we wouldn't ask for it. One day he couldn't reach me, and he said, where were you? And I didn't know where I was, but I just needed some peace and quiet. I said, I was in the bathroom. The next day there was a phone in the bathroom. To cope with all the activity he generated, Johnson doubled his staff of female secretaries and made them work in shifts. With that, he put the head of the civil service to work, finding his ideal of a working woman. I want the five smartest, best educated, fastest, prettiest secretaries in Washington. All right. And I want to put them right here under my office where I can get them and dictate. I waited an hour and a half this morning and had the goddamn cabinet sitting around waiting to try to get the State of the Union out. And people that can't spell their name operate, and I just don't think the president ought to have to do that. Absolutely not. I don't want any old, broken-down old maids. I want them from 25 to 40. <laughs> I want them that can work Saturday and Sunday. Right. I want them that can work at night, not be afraid to go home after the Secret Service takes them out of the gate. I want them to have a college degree, if it's at all possible, mm -hmm. and be able to keep secrets. And I've got to have some people that I can trust. One recruit was Johnson's personal choice, a young woman he'd noticed in a government office. Late one night, he asked Jack Valenti to find her home number. Hello. Where are you? I'm at home. Who's this? This is the president. Oh. What are you doing? Oh, I think someone's playing with me. No, 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 no. I won't talk to you about our work, honey. Where are you at home? Oh, yes, I am. Are you busy? No, I'm not. Can you come down here immediately? Oh, I'd be glad to. Come down. I've got Jack Valenti here, and we want to talk to you about the little reassignment. Mr. Ross, please, please. This is Jack Valenti speaking. Yes, sir. Would you send a car to pick up uh, Miss Whittington? Miss Whittington? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right. This is 1045 at night, but he says, I want to visit with you. He didn't mean... 9 o'clock tomorrow morning or 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. You mean now? She called me and um, said we had to have lunch that day. And she told me what had happened. And she was um, almost in shock. And she said, what's up? I said, he wants a black secretary. But if I were you, I'd grab it, but I'd be leery and wary because he is a Vesuvius of a man. So now, the President's visitors to the Oval Office, including all those crusty old senators from America's Deep South, would walk past a black girl on their way to see the Chief. But how to make it public? Parade his discovery before the White House press? No, too blatant. Johnson had a better idea. Now, let's all play What's My Line? And now to meet our first challenger. And uh, we'll let the audience in the theater and the audience at home know exactly what your line is. Uh, Miss Whittington, may both men and women enjoy your services. Yes. Miss Whittington, does your service require any physical dexterity of any kind? Yes. Well, do you work for a non-profit making organization? <laughs> Uh, are you connected with the White House in any way? Yes. Are you a secretary? Yes. Very good, Doris. Miss Whittington is about as secretary as you can get if you're attached to the White House. Miss Whittington is one of President Johnson's secretaries. Well, the president has great warmth. He's fair, kind, but at the same time, he demands total excellence at all times. There is no doubt that um, in those days, Black people paid a lot of attention to the proximity of blacks to power. So the fact that he had a black secretary, those of us who were in Washington watched those things and calibrated, and people out in the country um, cared. It was a tiny step in an uphill climb towards Johnson's number one objective, to enact a civil rights bill that would guarantee black Americans access to thousands of places that had excluded them for nearly a hundred years. Shops, hotels, restaurants. It was the bill Kennedy had failed to get through Congress. Johnson believed America was ready for change. 
and that he was the man with the political muscle to force the Congress to give in. We have talked long enough in this country about equal rights. We have talked for a hundred years or more. It is time now to write the next chapter and to write it in the books of law. Johnson craved praise. In the next two hours, he made 33 telephone calls asking, how did I do? Nearly every call was to someone whose approval he knew he could count on. This one is typical. It's to Adam Clayton Powell, the black congressman from Harlem. Did I do all right on silver right? My friend, it was unequivocally the finest that uh, I said to, it was more than I hoped for. And it was the finest that anyone could say. Forthright, it was really wonderful. You, you were at your best today. Absolutely superb. I don't know when you got the time to do it, though. Well, they had 34. You, know, you, you all were generous. You had 34 applause in 24 minutes. I know you have good ghostwriters, but brother, that was good in Bang Johnson. That wasn't any ghostwriter. That speech was absolutely magnificent. The new president had a special relationship with Congress. He sent a small army of aides to Capitol Hill. I'd tell a senator or a congressman, a congressman, senator, the president must have your vote. And I want to tell you that if you give it to him, he will always remember. But if you don't, he'll never forget. He now made a personal call to Dr. Martin Luther King to say the civil rights movement had an ally in the Oval Office. But I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. Then Johnson telephoned the more radical black leaders, men like James Farmer of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Farmer had never spoken to a president. The phone rang, and a um, uh, southern female voice said, uh, Mr. Farmer? I said, uh, yes. Mr. James Farmer? I said, yes. I said, hold the line for the president. Well, naturally, I started to... Uh, say, uh, President of what? And uh, Lyndon Johnson's voice came on the telephone. Um, he said, Mr. Farmer, and now we are going to have to to um, pick up the ball and... Not, not move that ball and let's go and go right on through to that goal line and then not ever... Well, it might get run out of bounds time or two, but uh, keep coming and... Uh, Went down to see him in Washington. And come right in, Mr. Farmer. Uh, sit down in that big chair. That's a Texas-sized chair. And uh, as he was jerking my arm out of the socket, his phone rang. And he answered it. It was some senator uh, calling, returning his call. And he was twisting this caller's arm, trying to get him to commit himself to vote for the civil rights bill. Now, you're either far civil rights or you're not. You're either the party of Lincoln or you ain't. And that's about God put up or shut up. And we've been talking about this for 100 years. Looks like it's about time to stop talking. Right now, I just think that we're going to have them out in the streets again if we don't uh, don't make some little progress. He was doing all that he could. And all the while, he was throwing a glance at me to make sure that I was uh, listening. Now, when he finished those conversations, I asked him, Mr. President, how did you get to be that way? What happened? I said, I know that your background on civil rights has not been very good. In fact, it's been bad. He said, well, Mr. Farmer, that's a good question, a fair question. And I will answer it by quoting a friend of yours, and you will immediately recognize the quote. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty... I'm free at last. A quotation, of course, from Martin Luther King. For 30 years, as a congressman and senator, Lyndon Johnson had looked over his shoulder at the highly conservative voters of Texas. Now he had a wider constituency, America. 
Six months later, Martin Luther King was just behind the president as he signed the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, the act that broke apartheid in the southern states of America. The Pasha and I will continue with Hello, Mr. President, right after this short break. Passionate Eye continues with Hello, Mr. President. Thirty days and a few hours ago, John Fitzgerald Kennedy died a martyr's death. By Christmas of 1963, America's 30 days of official mourning for the assassinated president was over. But Kennedy's presence still dominated Washington. Johnson found his uninhibited Texan style being unkindly compared with the grace and elegance of his predecessor. Sophisticated Washington wags used to joke about LBJ padding about the White House at night, turning out the lights. He even abolished the floodlighting, giving the place a haunted look. One day, wanting a group photo of his family, he telephoned a stillless cameraman he knew. Again, this is the original sound. We have edited the pictures. Mr. Sands, this is Lyndon Johnson. Mr. Johnson, yes, sir. Can I talk to you now without getting in the paper and getting it advertised? Oh, surely. Uh, if not, I won't talk to somebody else, but I hope I can. But I don't want it in any of these columns now, and I don't want it to get out. I give you my solemn word as a gentleman. All right. Now, uh... I'm a poor man. I don't make much money, but I got a wife and a couple of daughters and uh, four or five people that run around with me, and I like the way you make them look. This is your country, and I want to see what you want to do about it. Now, how can you come down here and make them look better? Uh, I, I just have to live off of a, a paycheck, and I'm in debt, but I want to, I want to see if you can't come and uh, uh, bring whoever you need, and we'll pay the transportation, but we can't pay you much else. Mr. Johnson, don't even worry about that. All right, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, sir. Actually, Johnson was a rich man, but he never paid for the pictures. He was instinctively frugal, even parsimonious. He always had been, from his days as a teacher in the small town of Catulla on the Mexican border. This was a man who lived through the Depression. He saw poverty. The Mexican children that he first saw and taught came to school hungry. He knew the value of a dollar, and he worked hard for the, for the dollar, he thought. Um... One of the more amusing things that I, I, well, he, he recycled styrofoam cups by washing them. And Mrs. J would be upset if she heard me say that. But that's, he, he felt a styrofoam cup should not be thrown away. You wash it, use it again. Attacking poverty was another Kennedy idea, but Kennedy had only observed in middle age while campaigning in West Virginia, and he put little political effort into the program to eliminate it. Johnson had seen it in close-up from his youth. His telephone calls to his planners show what a high priority he was willing to give these social programs, at the expense even of defense. You go and get me a good, solid program that Harry Bird will look upon with pleasure, and I'll approve it. You just get me not over two pages, short sentences, short paragraphs, and and let's have some good for this State of the Union that uh, that Galbraith won't be giving us hell and saying that Johnson's not forward-looking enough. <laughs> Have you ever talked to ABC? Have they asked you to appear lately? And you just tell them that we're cutting out archaic, out-of-date installations, teaching boys to fly, and we don't need them flying. We're going to use missiles. Right. And we're not going to make more atomic bombs than we need, because that makes Russia make more. And, and we may lose 300. We may lose 300 workers, but we'll put them to work on poverty. And that uh, we're going to have the tightest budget that anybody's had, and since your knowledge but it's going to be full for human need. That Christmas, he invited his chief domestic advisors to join his family in sunny Texas. But they were there to work. What he demanded of them was a plan to lift 20% of Americans out of poverty, 32 million men, women, and children. And I remember he said, now I want you guys to get in that guest house and close the door and don't come out until we, we have a plan to deal with this poverty situation. And it was kind of funny to hear the cows mooing outside our windows and shuffling around. I would just go verbatim with that. I don't know. 
And here we're sitting around a little secondhand kitchen table, uh, scratching out ideas. And uh, we worked several days in there, and we came out with a name, The War on Poverty, and the outlines of the plan. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. He had some fundamental beliefs. He believed that government's role was to help the poor and the most vulnerable among us. Without Lyndon Johnson, you wouldn't have Medicare to provide health care for the elderly. You wouldn't have Medicaid to provide health care for the poor. You wouldn't have this flush of civil rights legislation, which has changed the politics of the United States of America in many, many states. It was an incredible onrush of legislation. It changed this country. We have a right to expect a job to provide food for our families, a roof over their head, an opportunity to have our children educated, and with your support, and with your help, we will have it in America. Thank you. His opponents on Capitol Hill could do little to block his domestic policy, but Johnson knew that any hint of liberalism in foreign policy could be fatal. Have you got the language in front of you? Yes, sir. I got it in front of me. Oh. And it oughtn't to be in there, and it's just a damn... Agency on national in connection with the purchase in the reserve. That's right. Johnson is talking here to a congressman from Texas, Albert Thomas, about American grain sales to Russia. He's upset because Congress is insisting that he take personal responsibility for each individual sale. Read your language further. reports each determination. Why should I want to report to everybody that I screwed a girl? You screwed one last night, but you don't want to report it. I wish it did. Well, you know what I'm talking about. That made it uh, come home to you, didn't it? Well, it ain't gonna. Well, don't you think I'm a damned idiot now? No, 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 well, no, 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 of course not. But I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna hamstring you a bit on her. It doesn't hamstring me. It just publicizes that I'm pro-Russian. Right when Nixon's running against me. That's all it does. All right, well, you just don't ever agree that that's a good clause, because you know yeah, goddamn yeah. well it ain't. Don't try to shit me, because I know better. But I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. Texas and Washington was something that Johnson never understood, never, wasn't interested in, but that world was, as you know, festering, and that was Vietnam, and that was Asia, and he couldn't even pronounce the names of the places over there, he didn't have any idea where they were, he didn't have any idea who knew anything about them. Red terror tactics in South Vietnam hit at the United States Embassy in Saigon. Two Americans and 11 Vietnamese are dead. Kennedy had sent 15,000 military advisors to South Vietnam. It was a clear enough commitment. But Johnson worried about where it might lead. On March the 2nd, he called the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to read him a top secret analysis of options. One, pull out. Two, negotiate a settlement. Three, send in the Marines. Or. Four, we continue our present policy of providing training and logistical support to the South Vietnam forces. This policy has not failed, and we lose losing what we're doing. We've got to decide whether to send a man or whether to come out and let the dominoes fall, and that's where the tough one's going to be, and you do some heavy thinking, as little Jewish boy said. Yeah. Do some heavy thinking, let's decide what we do. Yeah. Okay. What the telephone calls underline 
is that both Johnson and the tight little circle of top brains he'd inherited from Kennedy were totally out of their depth on Asia. I just can't believe that we can't take 15,000 advisors and 200,000 people and uh, maintain the status quo for six months. I just believe we can do that if we do it right. Now, I don't know enough about it to, to know. No, no, I don't. Do you think it's a mistake to explain what I'm saying now about Vietnam and what we're faced with? Well, I, I do think, Mr. President, that it'd be wise for you to say as little as possible. I, the, the, the frank answer is we don't know what's going on out there. Saying as little as possible to the media was one thing. Johnson's problem was how he said it. To get the American people behind him, he had to be good on television, and he wasn't. Who is the father of us all? As a political animal, at full velocity, on stream, he was irresistible. One epical flaw. He never mastered television. He treated television in the same way that one picks up a wolf by the ears, very gingerly. And he, uh, he always thought that uh, whatever he did on television was uh, going to be compared with this enormously charming and fascinating uh, John Kennedy. So he became grandfatherly and presidential and oftentimes boring. Knowing he had a lot to learn, Johnson asked his wife, Lady Bird, to review his performance. She phoned his office from their private room upstairs. You want to listen for about one minute to uh, yes, uh, my critique, or would you rather wait till tonight? Yes, ma'am. I'm well enough. I thought that you looked strong, firm, and like a reliable guy. Your looks were, were splendid. The close-ups were much better than the distance ones. The answer is no to both your questions. Every now and then, you need a good, crisp answer for change of pace, and therefore I was very glad when you answered one man. Uh, the answer to, uh, is no to both of your questions. In general, I'd say uh, it was uh, a good B+. Plus. How do you feel about it? I thought it was much better than last week. At uh, any and, and rate, I felt uh, sort of on safe ground. I mean, like you had sort of uh, gotten over a, a hump psychologically and in other ways. And uh, I love you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. What Lady Bird Johnson called his psychological hump was Johnson's conviction that he would never be as good at projecting himself as the Kennedys. There are no revealing calls to or from Robert Kennedy, but there is one to his younger brother, Ted Kennedy, that sounds like an attempt to build bridges to the whole Kennedy family. Uh, I think we're going to put Senator Kennedy on here. Hello? Hello? Sandra? Oh, yeah. How are you? Fine. Teddy, how you doing? Oh, very well. I uh, saw your TV yesterday, and the president would have been so proud of you, and I was, and I just thought you hit a home run, and I wanted you to know how much I thought of it. Well, that's very, very uh, kind of you, uh, President. The last thing he would want us to do is to wind up disagreeing with each other, and we're just not going to do that, and any time something happens that you or the Attorney General, or your mother, your father, your sisters uh, feel ought to go differently, you put on your hat and walk in that office and sit down and say your speech, because I'm just a trustee that's trying to carry on best I can, and I'm, I'm aware of my problems and my limitations more than anybody else. And uh, we're going to we're going to put over his program, and he's going to be proud of it. And then we're going to go on to better things. And you always have me in your corner. Goodbye, Teddy. The date of that recording, March the 30th, 1964, is 120 days into his presidency. The rest of the recordings remain a secret for the time being. Four months later, Johnson was to break it to Robert Kennedy that he would not invite him to be his vice president for running mate in the election in November. As he told his friends, with Bobby on the ticket, he'd never know if he could be elected in his own right. But it was a decision that cut both ways. His landslide victory in 1964 was his own. But later, when American boys were dying in Vietnam, Senator Robert Kennedy would be free to oppose him. By 1968, Robert Kennedy's opposition had become an obsession. 
By chance, five recordings from this period have also emerged. Listen to how the Johnson tone has changed. I believe that Bobby is having his governors jump on me, and he's having his mayors, and he's having his Negroes, and he's having his Catholics, and he's having them just systematically one after the other each day. All of it makes Bobby look like a great hero and makes me look like a son of a bitch, and 95% of it is completely fabricated. What prompted that call was the publication of a book called Death of a President by William Manchester. To Johnson, it was one of several books grossly distorting his behavior in the aftermath of Kennedy's assassination. And my feeling on the Manchester book is I do not believe that we are equipped to cope with this. So I think they're going to write history as they want it written. I want my posture to be that we know what happened from our own knowledge of what happened, but we not let another human know it. I don't want to debate with him. I don't think the president of this country at this time ought to. I think it's just unthinkable that my whole morning be spent on this kind of stuff. Yes, sir. And I think that we've had a bunch of traitors and kids and things in there that just uh, just uh, uh, have brought it about. And I think that practically nearly every one of the Kennedy folks uh, have contributed to it. One year later, Robert Kennedy announced that he was running against Johnson for the presidency. Those who bear the responsibility for our present force they are the ones, the President of this United States, President Johnson, they are the ones who divide this country. For Lyndon Johnson, it was a private nightmare come true. When he knew that Bobby had come into the race, um, the thought of Bobby being there, and he could see that Bobby was out maneuvering, and he was sure that Bobby was going to be the real contender, and the thought of losing to that squirt, Bobby Kennedy, was so horrible to him that it was better that he get out in some gracious way and never have to be in a confrontation. In the end, Lyndon Johnson, for all of his power and all of his relish and manipulation, hated one-to-one -one confrontations. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Thank you for listening. Good night. And God bless all of you.